Okay. Well, welcome to another episode of the Scriptural Mormonism podcast. I'm your host, Robert Barlin. Uh, before we begin er, today's uh, interview with Josh Cayley, um, today is actually the eighth anniversary of my blog. So I just want to say uh, thank you very much to everyone who has followed it over the last eight years, uh, especially to those who have plugged it, like the late Bill Hamblin, Dan Peterson, Blake Osler, and a host of others as well. I do appreciate it. And here's to another eight years at least, uh, more as well. And of course, today is also important because today is the 20th uh, episode of of the podcast, which I started in February. And uh, we have a very special guest. We have Josh Gailey, who has written a, a book that just recently came out, Witnessing Miracles, Historical Evidence for the Resurrection and Book of Mormon, which I have here in hardback. It's also available in paperback. And in the show notes, I'll include a, a, the link to the Amazon page for this. So um, Josh, uh, thank you for coming on today. It's so great to be with you, Robert. It's really a pleasure. It's nice to be with somebody with a, a fellow anthropology degree and just be able to talk shop a little bit. Yeah, um, when I find out you also had a degree in that kind of discipline, it's like, oh, good. Um, there's more than one of us. That's right. That's right. It's a it's a narrow niched field. So, yeah, there's not that many people with anthropology degrees, let alone those in the broad restorationist perspective who actually has degrees in that. Um, they're either usually Mesoamericanists or they're usually working in completely unrelated fields. So, right, right. But, uh, pleasure to have you on. Uh, before we kind of go into the uh, topic of today's uh, podcast, how about uh, you just give a brief introduction to who you are? Like, what's your background in terms of your education? Although you hinted at some of it, and also your. Um, you're not actually a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, but you're a member of a uh, group with the broad restorationist perspective. So maybe um, make a reference to that as well, if you wish. Oh, thank you. Yeah, my name's Josh Gailey. I'm an ordained evangelist in the Church of Jesus Christ. Our church is headquartered in Pennsylvania. So if you're looking, okay, well, that name sounds similar. So who are these guys? You know, we're just headquartered in a different place. We're a small church with an international footprint. You know, we're in about 23, 24 countries around the world. So we are a, a restoration church that follows its its line of succession to the angel through Sidney Rigdon and eventually to William Bickerton and, and beyond. So you can, you know, if somebody's looking for weight, well, how do they how do they line up here within the scope of the restoration movement? You know, Sidney Rigdon would be the name that probably resonates to most and how you would funnel your way down to our organization. And so, yeah, I have a degree in archaeological science from Penn State and have always been fascinated by, I remember my, Robert, I remember my first class at Penn State. I'm, you know, I'm this freshman, I'm, I'm in this class and my first class was bioanth, right? So it, it was, you know, study of human evolution, basically. And I'm sitting in the first class and the professor gets up and says, well, if anybody has any strong religious beliefs, leave them at the door. They're not welcome in the classroom. And he just goes on. And I'm sitting there shell-shocked, right, as a 18, you know, whatever kid, 19-year-old whatever kid just sitting there. But he ended up being my academic advisor. We had a great relationship. But, you know, it was so formative for me. It was great to have the challenge and even to see some of the debate between faith and science, which actually I like to strip away. I think we make more... Uh, debate than 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 what we should on both sides of the the arrangement, but it that's my background. I have a degree in in arc sci from Penn State that gives me a little bit of the historical background, and I, I came out with this book uh, several years ago because I was studying through the evidence for the resurrection of Jesus, and was really actually preparing for a presentation. I was invited to a Book of Mormon symposium by some good friends from some of the independent branches in, in Missouri, and they put on a Book of Mormon symposium and I was asked to speak. And I, I didn't want to just rehash something that was somebody else's material. I was looking for something original and I, I was coming across all this research for asking the question, well, was there really an empty tomb? Were there, was, did Jesus really rise from the dead? And the parallels of founding miracles just jumped at me. And that was the beginning back in 2015. And, you know, several presentation, you know, several presentations, several events later, and, and several years later, there's actually a book that's come out of this. I've train myself in the historical method that these scholars have used. Yeah. And, and taken the same approach to cross compare of, and, and basically my, what I say is 
and then I'll, I'll pass the ball back to you. I don't mean to run with the ball, but you know, what I basically say is, is if historians that are dealing in apologetics for Jesus Christ have established the criteria to test a miracle from history, how do the golden plates compare? How does Joseph Smith compare with the coming forth translation and production of the Book of Mormon as the founding miracle for the restoration movement, for the churches that you and I are both a part of, whether you're part of the Church of Jesus Christ or the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, you know, we come from the same foundation of, of one miracle, okay? And, and how does that miracle test using the same standard already established by people like Michael Lacona, Gary Habermas, William Lane Craig, N.T. Wright. There are prominent scholars that believe Jesus Christ really did rise from the dead, not just from a faith-based perspective, but from some of the historical grounds that they would argue that the best explanation of the facts on historical grounds is Jesus rose. And I believe using the same criteria, the best explanation of the facts is Joseph really did have golden plates that he translated by the gift and power of God into the Book of Mormon. And, and it's a living miracle for us today from more modern times. Oh, thank you for that. Uh, and thanks for the introduction. Um, you kind of mentioned you were for, uh, got your degree in Penn State. Uh, my brother was basically all but dissertation at PhD level in political science in Penn State. Uh, so I've heard nothing but nice things about that area. So, we are. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay, and you also uh, gave, gave a good overview of like uh, what le the impetus, if you will, of your research as well as your book, um, which again I'll link to in the show notes to the Amazon page. Everyone should read it. Um, Thank you. Uh, because there's not many L non when the broad restorations perspective other uh, than LDS or mainstream or Brighamite, if you will, interactions with say Book of Mormon historicity and stuff like that. So I think even just for that, it's very interesting. But overall, I did like how you. Uh, use the minimum facts theory of Lycona at all to demonstrate, well, if you're being consistent, you have to conclude something, what's going on when it comes to Joseph Smith, that's not explained naturalistically, and we can exp we can explore that a bit more. Um, but before we begin, like, um, one thing that will be coming up is what's called the minimum facts theory and for the resurrection. So maybe if you were to give like an overview, like say, just the, uh, the apologetics for that, like, um, a, an abbreviated version, like say how a Lycona, a Mike Lacona or an N.T. Wright, and you have their two hefty books, The Resurrection of the Son of God and Lycona's book on the resurrection as well. Um, yeah. yeah. This side of the bookshelf. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes, and we're also doing some uh, impromptu uh, advertising for uh, Frank Gardner's commentary in the background as well. So, uh, <laughs> yes, yeah, it is. Hopefully the reality checks will actually just uh, come in for both of us today. But uh, there, we there we go. There we go. You've 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 got plenty of opportunities for royalty in that room. I see. So I I think <laughs> you've uh, I I moved my computer and desk up a little bit to make it look like this bookshelf is is really big, but. Uh, I, my stacks would not be quite that size there, Robert. So uh, I'm just blessed. Trilly does not have uh, is not an earthquake zone. <laughs> but, uh, um, so what is the minimum facts theory? Uh, because that's if you if you study like say resurrection apologetics and its historicity, and of course if it's not obvious enough, we both accept the historicity not just of the Book of Mormon and it's coming forward, but the historicity of the physical resurrection of Christ. I mean that's a central tenet. If you take you take Amen. text seriously, you know, um, not yeah. just the restoration, but especially the restoration. So what is this thing that's uh, often you called by Habermas, Lycona? I don't think Wright often uses it, but it's basically how he approaches it. What's called the minimum facts theory uh, for the restoration. Yeah, Wright doesn't use it in his works, but in his podcasts and his discussions, he definitely accepts it. Okay. So his approach was a little different, but yeah, in general, what you'll see is people taking, um, breaking down historically on historical grounds and simplifying the arguments for the resurrection to a series of, of core facts, okay, that both a, a sympathetic scholar and an agnostic or atheist scholar might all agree with, okay, somebody like a, a Gerd Ludemann or somebody else would agree with the core facts. So, just to give you an example, Jesus Christ was crucified. All right, there would be that simple statement would be a minimal fact in the broader argument towards the resurrection. And you build these three or four minimal facts with a lot of background and documents and, you know, 
So Jesus Christ was crucified, for example, that simple statement. You know, actually, you'll have atheist scholars like Bart Ehrman, or he he would consider himself agnostic, but, you know, that would all agree with that, okay? They would say that you'll hear even them say that's one of the best attested events from antiquity, the, the crucifixion of Christ. You know, you have uh, not just sympathetic sources that might be sympathetic like Josephus, but you have Tacitus, Lucian, you know, Marabar, Serapion. You have different Roman, you know, senators, historians that are all in agreement. Christ was judged, killed. In fact, even through the critical sources, you can come up with, and there's a paragraph in the book on this, basically, you can see Jesus Christ was purported to do miracles, that he was judged and condemned, he was crucified, and that Christians were still worshiping him, you know, decades, if not a century or two later. You can get that through some very early critical sources of Christianity. So the the crucifixion is really not disputed. It's an accepted minimal fact. All right. Now what you can go on and uh, William Lane Craig makes a strong push, even stronger than Lacona for the empty tomb. Okay. And using some core principles again for the empty tomb, things like proximity, the fact that the tomb was within walking distance from Jerusalem. So if, if you wanted to know if the tomb was empty, while the disciples were preaching the fact that Jesus was resurrected, you could go and find out for yourself. Okay. You know, um, enemies, you know, Matthew 28 talks about enemies, even admitting the fact that there's an empty tomb when they say things like, well, the disciples stole the body. And there's, there's a worse source by that, by Justin Martyr that some people refer to. I don't think that's very strong, but you have, you have two that are out there that Basically, the enemies are are floating around the rumor that the disciples stole the body. Well, that's that's an admission of the empty tomb. Unlikely testimonies. Well, the the women in the Gospels are the first to the empty tomb, right? So that's so controversial in that time, based on that culture, that even when Paul gives his list in 1 Corinthians 15 and other references to the resurrection and the witnesses, the women get dropped. Okay, well, why? Why do the gospel say it, but it gets dropped in other sources? Well, it's an embarrassing admission, all right? You you decide history kind of like a courtroom case, and there's some core principles to break down and understand these facts. People don't admit embarrassing things about themselves unless they're true. Like, think of a courtroom case. Somebody that pleads guilty, we accept that plea, okay? So we, in general, if somebody's willing to self-incriminate, We accept their self-incrimination. And statistically speaking, the overwhelming percentage of people that plead guilty are, in fact, guilty. Historically, that that bears out. Okay, so uh, other things like, you know, you could even think of it a lot simpler. Like, say two, uh, I guess, two rugby teams maybe in Ireland or something are playing. And, you know, one player from a different team plays very well and the opposing coach compliments their play. pretty good chance that player played awesome that day, right? So, you know, an embarrassing admission is really likely to be true. You know, when you have multiple independent attestation, like I went into for the crucifixion, you have all these different, you know, non-Christian sources independently attesting to an event. Well, that that multiple independent attestation, when you have multiple witnesses, right? When you have more than one person testifying to an event, especially when they're unsympathetic, boy, that really launches it high. Eyewitness accounts, all right? The the example I often give, my ki- children are a little young yet. My my youngest son's five, my daughter's about, you know, almost one and a half, not quite. So in a couple years, Phoebe's going to be old enough to defend herself. She can't defend herself right now, but when she does, heaven forbid, there's going to be a scuffle in my house one day, all right? And when they do, the kids are, oh, even when eyewitnesses disagree, I'm still going to know the kids fought. All right. So eyewitnesses can tell us a lot. Okay. So you want to get closest to the original sources that you can. And you use all these criteria to break down what these minimal facts are. The fact that, yeah, Jesus was crucified. Yes, there was an empty tomb. You have unlikely testimonies of the women that they're the culture at that day basically said women were equal to a robber in believability in a court, court of law. 
You have that in the in uh, the Talmud. You have statements like that in Josephus. So you, you build all these things, and then you know a, a third fact. So we have two I've listed so far. I'll give a third. You know, the crucifixion of Christ, number one. Two, the fact that there was an empty tomb. Okay, and three, you the disciples sincerely believed that they saw the risen Christ. Even a critical scholar accepts the fact that clearly the disciples, clearly the early apostles, at least believed that they saw it. If you want to give a counter explanation of what they really saw, you can. But no one really argues with the fact that the disciples sincerely believed that they saw something. And so those three facts can get art compiled together and argued on historical grounds for the best explanation of the facts. Now, this is something that comes from like a Behan McCullough. So this is now we're diving in, taking a step towards like the philosophy of history. All right. So when I went into the book, I was diving in to a lot of the details on philosophy of history because actually way too many people write. I've learned this now. Way too many people write biographies and write history without a historical method. And it it kind of shocked me when I dove into this to realize this. So what we're doing is we're raising the standard of history by applying some of these metrics into our conclusion. And that's the approach of Craig and Lacona and others, is they really dive into then using the minimal facts approach, then looking at, okay, what's the best explanation of the facts? And when you do, you want something that's not contrived, right? Not You want the least amount of ad hoc that you can. You want something that's very plausible, all right? Makes the least amount of assumptions of something. That it has explanatory scope and power. So it's explaining the most data and the most sources that you have. And it's offering a very, um, very clear scope of that. So, you know, if somebody, I'll give you an example of, of where this kind of falls, say somebody saw a pig in the sky and they concluded, well, hey, pigs fly. Well, that might not be the best explanation of the facts. It's probably a better explanation would be, frankly, the pig fell out of a airplane or, you know, got tossed off of the barn side of the barn. Okay. There's, there's other explanations that might be significantly better than that. That's, it's, you know, you don't want something that is contradicts normative terms. Okay. So basically, when you look at the facts regarding the resurrection, it is argued that the best explanation of the facts, the inference to the best explanation, is that Jesus indeed rose from the dead. And the only assumptions that that's being made there is God exists. Okay. If you're willing to accept the fact that God exists, then it is not beyond the it, it uh, the resurrection offers tremendous explanatory power and scope regarding all the surrounding facts and details that are answering it it accounts for why eyewitnesses would be martyred be willing to be martyred you know and all these surrounding details you know about the the resurrection we can dive in that more if you want to but that's to, to basically break it down, you use all the historical data in front of you to break it down to the, the smallest series of facts that both a critic and a believer would agree with. And then you take those and you try and best explain those with your conclusion. And you, you can put that out there and let the historical community tear it up and down or agree with it or critique it. But everybody's then trying to say, hey, Here's the facts. What's the best explanation? And it gets argued very strongly by Craig and Habermas and Lacona and others that the best explanation of the facts is Jesus truly did physically, bodily rise from the dead and as a, as a miracle. And so they've, they've created that groundwork to, to test a miracle from history. I'm a believer, so I'm biased, but I have reviewed the work. And if you're willing to accept that a miracle is possible, they make a very strong case. Oh, no, th thank you for that. That's actually a very good, uh, actually excellent overview of the uh, minimum facts theory. So I appreciate that. Now, I'm sure like some will say like, well, where can we get like um, 
the references to Jesus outside the New Testament or like are the Gospels or the eyewitness uh, testimony. Now, I know you briefly touched upon that in your book, but there's actually a very good uh, volume and it's actually affordable. Uh, Jesus Outside the New Testament, an introduction to the ancient evidence by Richard Van Voorst. Uh, was published by Ehrman's in 2000. So if anyone's uh, listening Excellent. to this... Yeah. So if anyone's listening to this uh, podcast and you want to delve more, it came out about 20 plus years ago. So it could be uh, the Josephus material could be uh, beefed up a little bit because there's been some more research over the last few years. But even Christ mysticists like Richard Carey admit this is the single best volume on this particular topic. So that says a lot. And for the uh, Gospels as eyewitness accounts and eyewitness testimony, even if it's like a uh, view that's poo-pooed by some uh, more liberal scholars, uh, Richard Bauckham in his book, Jesus and the Eyewitnesses, it's now in its second edition, also published by Erdman's, uh, is an excellent book. Um, there's been attempts to critique it, but they've been pretty lame, like uh, Bart Ehrman in his book on the... Um, the oral traditions underlining the Gospels, like only spends like two pages basically saying Bauckham's wrong, and that's basically it. <laughs> the, the responses have been, I'll be blunt, pathetic. Uh, yeah. Largely because I think Bauckham just does a. I don't agree with Bauckham when it comes to theology. I think his Christology is a mess, and he has. I'm not sure if you're familiar with his Christology, but he has this idea, like, say, divine identity, and he tries to read strict numerical monotheism into everything in the Oh, okay. It's it's kind of crazy, and he yeah. also he he also has an Eastern Orthodox view of the brothers and sisters of Jesus, uh, while not holding to perpetual. Really? Mary. Yeah, he believes that they're uh, children from a previous marriage of Joseph, although he does not believe in the perpetual virginity of Mary. It's 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 kind of odd, but. Although he's a bit of an odd duck theologically when it comes to uh, his material and the historicity of the Gospels, I highly recommend uh, the second edition of Jesus and the Eyewitnesses. I've plugged it many times. It hasn't been refuted and it's just kind of either been dismissed or it's been persuasive. So uh, that that would be a good volume for those who want to like uh, maybe delve more into like say New Testament Gospel issues and stuff like that. Um, so, but no, and just, even just just even you know, if somebody want something that's free and readily acceptable you know reasonable faith by william lane craig has a number of his debates and that even includes a debate with ehrman so you know you could see both sides there putting forth their their best foot forward either for or against the the resurrection the, those are you know uh my poor wife secondhand has listened to way too many of those and yeah. as i was uh prepping for for the book so no, yeah i'm not a fan of craig on many issues uh like his clam cosmological argument but um he's very, yeah he, he's an excellent debater he's scarily intimidating when it comes to debate because he's he it's a skill and he has it down to a t also a good debate is from 2003 between michael lacona and richard carrier this was before carrier embraced christ mythicism uh and it's probably one of the best debates because you hear probably one of the best non-historical uh explanations for the resurrection against lycona who at the time was working on his work that uh that came out in 2010 so that's yeah. an excellent debate as well on youtube um they had a second debate which was a bit more relaxed and i don't think it was as good but the first debate in 2003 was phenomenally excellent because you hear like two of the best the, of course this was before carrie went totally crazy and embraced christ mythicism which is nonsense but um don't hold that against him too much. But no, as I said, that, that's a very good uh, overview uh, of the facets of uh, minimal facts. Now, I'm sure like, and we were briefly chatting about this before the podcast began, one of the assumptions you must embrace to uh, conclude, of course, God raised Christ from the dead uh, would be, of course, you can't assume what's called metaphysical naturalism, i.e. the supernatural does not exist. And I've heard some, like say, Bert Ehrman claiming, well, if you believe um, in divine intervention, historical uh, details you must believe ipso facto or a priori uh, all claims of the divine um like muhammad and you know all these other claimants so um before we kind of delve into like how we can transpose this into say joseph smith and the book of mormon um how would you respond to that i think it's fair to critique this and say if this is true what about this miracle what about that miracle and i think it's very fair to look at somebody like Muhammad under the same, you know, same scope. Here's, here's miracle claims. You know, I was interviewed by Stephen Pinecker when this came out. And I said, Hey, if there's some miracle that happens in India, you know, and, and there's a lot of witnesses, you know, it, it would be my job as a, I, I'd have to take my theological hat off. Okay. And at least approach the question from a historical standpoint, okay? So this is a testable hypothesis. Now, I think you and I would both agree when when you look at something like Muhammad 
there's a clear gap in the records that happens and there's some questions about when things congealed and when they came about that's very different than the new testament where the new testament manuscript tradition can go back very early you know when and i'm going to keep circling back because i might not be an expert over here but when you when you circle around to the resurrection okay you can trace your sources really early when you look at first corinthians 15 and paul's account that is something that i mean even critical scholars say yeah I mean, the most critical scholar might say five, six years after the resurrection is when, and First Corinthians 15, for those that might be unfamiliar, Paul's saying basically, you know, Jesus rose and he was seen by so-and-so and he was seen by so-and-so and he was seen by so-and-so. And last of all, he was seen by me as one born out of due time. And in in those verses three through seven, it scholars in general, whether you're critical or not, Bart Ehrman accepts the fact that that's very early church tradition. Okay, that's, uh, they use the word creedal statement. I, I think that, you know, it might not be the word choice I'd use, but it's like an early and, and doctrine of the church. It dates about like maybe 56, Baron Year in his recent book on the uh, date of the New Testament uh, puts it around early 56. So you, yeah. have the you have the death and the resurrection of Christ in 30, you have something in 56, but you have this kind of oral tradition, um, only a few years according to Dunn and Ehrman, and maybe only a few months or weeks according to some others like Lacuna, but it's regardless of that like it's still considered historically speaking very early you know it's not for antiquity about as early as you can get right for antiquity i mean we're we're dealing with things like and actually you know some of muhammad's claims falls into much more common area of antiquity where you don't have the not only do you not have the originals but you're dealing with texts that are hundreds and hundreds of years later that you can't necessarily trace back as, as early as you can the new testament and the same is true for even like you know, well, so many Roman historians, so much of that material that would just be unquestioned historically. Well, we're we're dealing with manuscripts that are hundreds and hundreds of years later and fractions of what was left. Too too many times invaders burn books. Okay, let me make a pitch to everybody on the podcast. Stop burning books. We need books to exist. Okay. It just really helps historians over time. Yeah. But also, you know, go to Mark. Also when it comes to bibliophiles like us, I think we still cry when we think of the Library of Alexandria. <laughs> but uh <laughs> Yeah. And anyway. and Book of Mormon believers cry when we think of what might have happened in the New World, right? So, you know, I so like Mark, I was gonna say, you know, Mark didn't see the crucifixion, but he records it. So he's depending on an earlier source. And so there's even some critical historians that date it to within seven years of the activating events. So there's there's things like that that funnel us very early. And that's one thing that differentiates the New Testament from so many other miracle claims from history is the fact that you are getting, you know, if we're shooting bows and arrows, all right, and you're, you know, and I'm having to launch something from way too far away from across a, a soccer stadium or a football stadium and i'm trying to hit this target with a you know a recurve you know i'm well i'm just angling it and it's just a hope and a prayer to get close to the target and imagine the targets us discovering what actually happened multiple early sources allow you to stand closer to the target and fire off your conclusions okay and the new testament allows us to stand much closer to the target and fire off conclusions and when you transition to you know, the restoration movement. Now we're in the 1800s. There's a plethora of, obviously, there's a plethora more of sources, diaries, journals, accounts, people sitting in a pew listening to a sermon, people traveling here and there and recording what they heard that you can compile and start to evaluate and test critically, historically, and examine some of the truth claims that are coming out for a miracle much more recently in history. Yeah, um, no, I think you, what you bring up is very good because um, there's limits to what we can actually know just from a purely historical perspective due to antiquity, like the lost manuscripts, whether deliberate or accidental, um, and a host of other things. And like the very fact it's about 1900 plus years uh, away from us and our media is not the same. Like, you know, we're have, you're in uh, Philadelphia, I'm in Ireland. Like um, if we were to communicate like 1900 years ago, it we may only have like one correspondence before the other dies. It, it would take that long. <laughs> <laughs> right. You know, and here we are. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, um, but even in the 1800s, like uh, the 
although the communication was not as good as it used to be, obviously it would have been much better than it was in, say, second century Palestine. But even then, uh, of course, there would still be limits, you know, like um, no stenography, you know, no uh, dictation uh, machines and stuff like that. You know, there would be still limits, but of course, there, uh, and we'll discuss this more, the uh, the manuscript traditions that we have is uh, pretty solid when it comes to, like, certain topics, you know. Yeah. But, yeah. Uh, no, I think that's a good point. I think if, from my study of, like, other miracle claims, I think, relatively speaking, the best is actually, um, if you're familiar with the miracle of the sun in Fatima, uh, October 1917. Um, no, no, that's oh, cool. Okay, well, yeah, I... I, I used to be a Catholic and I've written a book on Mariology. It's like uh, Fatima is like one of the main miracles. I think relatively speaking, that's best because you do have some eyewitnesses to some kind of solar event that's going on. But I do think there's a naturalistic explanation, but I think relatively speaking, that's probably the best one uh, that yeah. could be used as a counter. And maybe in the future podcast or blog uh, series, I'll discuss um, Fatima. Um, I've discussed its theology, but I still have to discuss the miracle of the sun. So, um, uh, well, and it's interesting when we talk about our own limitations on this, Robert, I think one thing that's interesting to me is the fact that we can't test every miracle from the New Testament. Okay, so think about Mary's account. All right, so, and, and Joseph, Mary and Joseph. All right, well, it's in the gospel, but Mark doesn't have it at all. John talks about it in much more theological terms that get debated still to this day, okay, across the Christian movement. You're, you're limited on your, your sources here. There is no extra biblical account that is treating this in the same way as you would treat something like the crucifixion. So, and Mary's not directly writing the gospel and so we what we might have is at now by the way by me saying this am no way am i re rejecting the fact that christ was born of a virgin okay but i from on historical grounds can i test the miracle on historical grounds to say yes an angel appeared to mary all right y yes you know uh joseph had this dream those are personal experiences, and I can't test that. You know, cross-compare that. You know, you and I were uh, talking about Robert Bowman's work a little bit. All right. So, you know, he uh, – and here, I'll I'll put it up. I have notes, I you know, and all this stuff. Yeah, yeah. Jesus is – We'll discuss that because I think – We'll go there. Okay. It's a, good, it's a good file to, like, say how you approach things, how he approaches things. And – basically yeah. why Bowman is wrong, which is something that I've been saying for years, but we can discuss that later. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll dive into that with you when you're ready. But can, can we just to, then I'll just stay step back and, and focus on Christ's birth. You know, can we test those, that miracle historically that, that the Holy Ghost, you know, did what it did. And, and Mary, you know, was, you know, had a, had a baby as a, as a virgin. It, you, I'm sorry. You can't test that on the same historical grounds. It doesn't mean it didn't happen. It just means it's it's not te a testable event from antiquity because under the, this historical the method. Print it would leave would not, of course, be the same as the resurrection or deeper in the Red Sea. Yeah, yeah. Basically, jo like Joseph's dream. You can't test Joseph's dream. Joseph either had the dream or he didn't have the dream. You know, and you know some of those things. You you just you're accepting what's reported on on faith there, not necessarily on anything else. So, yeah. And that's okay. On, on religious grounds, that's okay. If, if you want to believe Muhammad went into a cave and had a, an incredible experience that began his calling as a prophet, you are accepting that on religious grounds. And that's okay. You're not accepting it on historical grounds. Sure. Okay. So that's, uh, that's a very good overview of, say, the minimum facts theory, the assumption of, um, the supernatural, although you don't have to embrace all claims of supernaturalism, you can still believe supernatural claims can be tested. You know, it's not like, say, um, as some have uh, characterized uh, it, you know, um, you know, you basically check your brain and accept all forms of the supernatural, uh, which is not, no one would claim that. Um, so uh, maybe if we were to transition just like, that's a very good methodology of like shown, at the very least, the apostles did believe in the resurrection and all these claims they did. pointing towards... Yeah. The reality of a physical resurrection in space and time ergo a miracle um 
maybe if we were to do like um transpose this into like say the uh restoration particularly the coming forth book more which your book uh does so uh, before we kind of go into like say possible criticisms and counters like bowman and at all um maybe if we were to give like a brief overview like uh, the memo fax case for the um historical reliability of the coming forth in book of mormon that you do in your book sure and i think what somebody might appreciate in my book is i don't hold back on a couple of controversial items that took place in history though the way i think i wrote it in my prelude was if something makes me uncomfortable, it makes me uncomfortable. I'm, I'm still going to talk about it as long as it pertains to the miracle. So whether it's adultery accusations, whether it's, you know, it doesn't mean the accusing party is correct. It just, you know, whatever it is, we're, we're going to discuss it in re as it relates to the Book of Mormon. So the Book of Mormon comes forth. There's radical claims, right? Joseph, you know, basic claims that Joseph Smith pulled out 50 pounds of a a gold copper alloy, alloy out of the ground that was inscribed in and buried in a hill in New York. That, that is a absolutely radical claim, man. And I just wanted to see if, if that could be tested, right? Can, can we test that? Did the Book of Mormon, is there any evidence that there were golden plates in a hill? And we're going to be using the same method, finding the same incredible to, you know, there. I love. I could sit here, open the book up, and and read citation after citation after citation from the eyewitnesses. I can do that all day. Um, I just am in, enthralled by the abundant source material of what's left behind. So, using eyewitnesses, using the category of embarrassing admissions, using the categories of multiple independent attestation. We can break down this, and I can go into great detail on a minimal set of facts that actually Bowman and others in their text technically agree with. Okay, I found I found in Bowman's work two or three of my facts that he agrees with. All right, so and that's the test. Am I do if I'm doing this correctly? A critical scholar should review my minimal facts. And say, oh, I can agree with the, those bare bone basic facts. All right. So, so my basic facts for the resurrection is that, you know, people sincerely believed Joseph Smith got plates out of a hill. All right. There, there were eyewitnesses that sincerely believed that Joseph Smith got plates out of a hill and showed them to him. Okay. There was an empty stone box on the west side of a hill in new york okay and and i go i i list four basic facts tied to the resurrection that i i don't think anybody would really dispute whether you're a critic or whether you're a believer and you know i'll, I'll just cross compare the the one i i speak on a lot but i think is powerful and is the empty tomb comparison and what might surprise people is the evidence for the empty stone box on a hill in New York is equal or stronger than the evidence for the empty tomb. And many historians accept the evidence for the empty tomb. So, you know, when you consider this as a minimal fact, you know, you have <clears throat> Joseph Smith describing the hole in the ground, its location, and you have him describing the actual stone box itself. Okay, so you have that explanation. You have Oliver Cowdery doing the same thing. All right. Now, he's probably getting a lot of that information from Joseph, but there's a there's another account describing the location. And then I have two non-members directly giving attestation of the empty stone box and the hole in the ground. I'll give one example that I think is the most powerful. Lorenzo Saunders. A critic, a treasure hunter, somebody that's super anti the Smith family, especially later on. Okay. He's somebody that is, you know, very anti everything. And he writes some later uh, letters and things that just is trying to trash the Smith family, tear everybody down. And he begins to talk in one of his letters about how he examined the hill. And yeah, there was a hole in the ground. 
and but it it wasn't recent and I checked it just weeks after or a week after Joseph got the plates and so it couldn't have been the plates couldn't have been come from there well in this letter he describes the fact that he finds a hole in the ground that had been excavated by human hands just a few years before a few years previously and that it was located on the west side of the hill that was in question well joseph smith first encounters the plates in 1823 and they remain in situ in the hill for four years so the hole had been dug several years before lorenzo's account actually corroborates everything we know historically and here he is as a critic trying to dismiss everything actually his account corroborates everything so here we have a testimony from an enemy that further supports the location and the fact that there was a hole in the ground exactly where joseph smith described it that is remarkable okay so and the fact that he's giving that decades later after the activating event, corroborating everything before it, is just really a slam dunk case. So you can, uh, David Whitmer first becomes intrigued by the whole story because he encounters people in the Palmyra area who are talking about the scuttlebutt, all these rumors floating around about golden plates. And David asks them, and in his, according to his account, he asks them, if there was anything to it and they say oh yeah and we know there is because we've been to the hill and we've seen the 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 hole in the ground and the stone box and that so convicted david whitmer that he tells his soon-to-be brother-in-law oliver cowdery about it his good friend oliver cowdery oliver decides to i mean here's two or of our three witnesses first hearing about these events in a believable way because enemies are trying to get at it people in palmyra at first it's not that they uh, didn't believe it. People in Palmyra, their reaction at first wasn't, ah, Joseph, that fool, that treasure hunters never found anything. All right. That, that wasn't their reaction. The treasure hunters that had signed agreements with Joseph and his family wanted their share of the profits. And so they're tearing up the Cooper shop across the road. You know, they're, you know, sending armed guards over to the house and creating all these ruses and Joseph has to flee for Palmyra for a time just to have a little bit of peace to start some translation work. It, it's so well attested that proximity, that remember, empty, empty tomb, proximity, location of the tomb to Jerusalem, enemies, unlikely testimonies, empty stone box in New York, proximity, just a few miles from Palmyra, just a few miles from the Smith home. Anybody that wanted to know if Joseph got anything could go and see for themselves, and several reportedly did. Enemies. The enemy's reaction is to try and steal the plates. There's opposition happening, and even they're admitting it in their own letters later that there was, in fact, on the west side of the hill in question, a hill, uh, a hole that had been dug. So proximity, enemies, unlikely testimonies. Again, just to just to birth the fact that we have a minimal fact here unlikely testimonies well we have the testimonies of women like catherine uh later salisbury you know uh catherine smith joseph's sister lucy you know holding the interpreters you you have emma moving the plates shuffling them around in the house it, it but i and even though women couldn't really testify in court at that time there was this this supreme you know defect of sex is the way it translates from the latin that that was still going on in the 1800s but even if you say well it's not antiquity it's not as bad as it was in jerusalem those testimonies of women aren't as unbelievable i'll, I'll give you two very unlikely testimonies under the category of unlikely testimonies isaac hale father-in-law to joseph you know uh, actually joseph first went to isaac hale on a treasure hunting expedition and boarded in the house all right um and paid for his lodging there well he met this cute brunette named emma and decided that he really liked her and wanted to ask permission to date her and isaac said absolutely not you treasure hunting joseph no way and so joseph and emma elope <laughs> it's just i find this so human I find this so human, all right? They elope, uh, get married under justice of the peace, go back to New York with the Smith family, 
Emma writes to her dad, wants to get her effects. Joseph goes to pick him up. Isaac is irate at his son-in-law. Uh, there's tears exchanged. Joseph begs apology and promise Isaac never to treasure hunt again. And four or five months later, he's now claiming to have golden plates out of a hill. And Isaac is not impressed at all. He is not impressed with his son-in-law. Okay, so eventually with all the enemies trying to steal the plates, Joseph and Emma seek peace in Harmony, Pennsylvania, where Emma's from, knock on the door of Isaac's house, ask to board there, and Isaac says, you are not coming into my house until I see those plates. And Joseph says, well, you can't see them, but they're in this box. Hold it, shake it, do anything you want. And Isaac wrote a letter reporting on this event. Now, that's a very unsympathetic source, attesting to the fact that Joseph did indeed have something that seemed like metal of the appropriate weight and size that it's purported. And on its own, that testimony would fall into obscurity. But when you compile it with all the eyewitnesses and everything else, it's a very unlikely testimony that bears truth. Josiah Stoll is the best one. Here's somebody that paid Joseph $14 a month to treasure, to, you know, to for the lottery ticket of treasure hunting of the day, right? To use folk magic and find something. So, you know, for the quick rich scheme, Josiah paid Joseph $14 a month to for treasure seeking. It, Josiah's family thought he was getting scammed. Took Joseph to court over it and uh, Joseph is in court and Josiah stands up and gives under oath says, well, I'm, he's not working for me anymore. That, that ship has sailed, but I was at his house the day he brought the plates home and he passed the plates through the window and the frock lifted and I saw the plates. And he described them as being gold. And he described the engraving. Josiah Stoll, if anybody should have been anti-Joseph, if anybody had been scammed, it was Josiah. And Josiah goes from being the most probable of critic to being the most unlikeliest of witness. And he later converts and stays in New York. He never goes west. But Josiah Stoll is a remarkable testimony of there being a real artifact. And that wasn't discovered until it, within this millennia, or within, yeah, this century, this millennia, that was when this these court records were uncovered. And all of a sudden, we have another witness of the golden plates from truly an, an unlikely source. It's not the official witnesses that, that we can talk about later or, or, you know, but so when you look at the minimal fact here, I did all this background to give you one minimal fact. There was a hole in the ground with an empty stone box. And there's a lot of, and, and there was, you know, talking about golden plates, you, the same principles that build the evidence for the empty tomb builds the evidence for the empty stone box and the golden plates. and. You know, I, I break down all this in the book down to a, a series of uh, digestible facts and then report on, you know, what actually is the best explanation. So there we go. No, uh, thanks for the uh, overview of that one fact. Like, uh, it's not just it's one fact, but like there's so much convergence of evidence that yeah. something is going on. I mean, um of the periods of church history, I'm probably the most well-read in, in terms of the original documents. It's probably the Joseph Smith era, um, and it never ceases to like amaze me in a positive way, like how physical the these things are. You know, you know the uh, the witnesses and like even hostile witnesses describe like say the plates and some of that three-dimensional space-time objects. They're tangible. And so on and so forth. Even so much so, like uh, Fawn Brody and even Dan Vogel have argued, perhaps you no know, Joseph actually had fifty or sixty pounds of plates, but they were like lead plates, you know. Or, s but even then, there's a concession there wasn't physical artifact, you know. Yeah. Um, no, and that's I, one of my minimal facts. One of my minimal facts is there was in fact an artifact 
of the purported size and dimensions given by the witnesses, which to your point is admit it. So that being a minimal fact is admitted by Bowman here. Mm -hmm. It's a, it's admitted by uh, Dan Vogel uh, very strongly. It's admit admitted by Fawn Brody. There you go. That, I mean, honestly, it, it doesn't get much more critical of an eye than two of those three. Okay. And, you know, they are admitting on one of my minimal facts. I disagree with their conclusion on what that artifact was. Okay. And I can debate, I can argue for my conclusion on very solid historical grounds. But, you know, so let's say the, so here we have one of the, uh, uh, an award winning biographer in Fodden Brody and uh, a well regarded critical historian in Dan Vogel. Okay. By, you know, from his, you know, from a non-believing side. Okay. Very well regarded. And they're saying, yeah, there's, there's something there. There's some artifact there that's metal. That's, you know, there's something to this. Okay. Well, that is quite an astounding admission. Especially to both. Unlike Bowman, both are like metaphysical naturalists. So, uh, and I think Vogel, although I think he would fight against it. He's basically a um, positivist. So, yeah. um, for him, of all people, to claim, yeah, there were probably a physical artifact, 50 or 60 pounds. And Joseph eventually believed his um, original pious deception and stuff like that. It, it, yeah. It's kind of indicating, like, you have to engage in all these gymnastics. All we have to say is, like, you have to accept the supernatural, and we can have... We can get there. Yeah, if you accept the supernatural, you don't have to engage in these gymnastics. You uh, you reject it. Like, you seem to, like, be engaged in special plane. Well, there were plates, you know, and there were artifacts, and they did believe it. But come on, angels, come on, dude. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's the... You have to decide which is more ad hoc, okay? Sure. Is it, is it more ad hoc that Joseph was... Even though he didn't really do metalworking, that he had enough expertise in the Cooper shop to create a set of tin plates and engrave in them in such a way that it had a black patina on them and shape them in such a form that he's able to fool uh, not only his own family, but also ran multiple strangers and, and fool them on the material that they are, you know, fool them on what they're made from. And it just, you know, when you start adding that up, it, it gets, it's actually forged plates become the very definition of ad hoc when you're using a best explanation of the facts, theory and method versus our prior assumption that God can do a miracle, you know, that, that, you know, in the metaphysical, okay, that that's the only assumption. Actually, I say, that I argue there's two assumptions I'm making. I'm I'm arguing for God's existence. Okay, number one. Uh, number two, I think you have to accept the fact that Jesus rose from the dead, because in Third Nephi, Jesus descends after his ascension at Temple Bountiful and appears before twenty five hundred. So, because of that, I'm making two assumptions. And for a Christian, this these would be very these two assumptions would not be scary assumptions, right? God exists, and you know. God rose Jesus from the dead. With those two assumptions, there's nothing that would stop you from doing a uh, being open to the fact that this other miracle may have occurred. And if it did, let's be clear, it's the strongest evidence to ever exist for the resurrection of Jesus Christ ever proffered to mankind, because now the Book of Mormon is giving a cross-continental independent attestation of a group of 2,500 people seeing the risen Lord. So, that alone should make somebody open to this pursuit because the opportunity is a slam dunk case. The title page of the Book of Mormon, Moroni says this is for the convincing of both Jew and Gentile that Jesus is the Christ. Well, what would be more convincing his, on historical grounds than 2,500 people saying, yeah, this is several thousand miles away, but we saw him too? No, I think, uh, no, that's a very good point because, like, worldview, like or not, does color your assumptions. We all have assumptions. We all have this kind of fancy team called Absolutely. Like, it's like, you have to recognize that. And, like, I didn't like, it's not the only divide, but, like, when it comes to, say, Vogel's really ad hoc arguments, you know, um, it, it really comes down to, like, his worldview of absolute. Uh, metaphysical naturalism. It does kind of color a lot of um, his um, claims. Although, when it comes to, say, the plates theory and stuff like that, it, it, it does kind of show, as you note, 
uh, believers in the Book of Mormon and Joseph Smith's claims is like we're pretty on we're on pretty solid ground for actually thinking it did happen. It wasn't like a fabrication or anything like that. Um, and of course, like it should be uh, obvious to uh, those listening in, we both accept Book of Mormon historicity. I, yeah, I'm, I'm sure like a, a uh, progressive in my church would like say something in the community of Christ will say, well, you know, the Book of Mormon's parabolic. You know, it's it's like no, um, for. My friend Stephen Smoot, he's currently a PhD candidate in uh, Egyptian and Semitic languages. He has an excellent article, um, "The Imperative for a uh, Historical Book of Mormon," uh, b- published by Interpreter. He kind of goes through and builds up on the work previously of uh, the late Bill Hamblin um, on why, if you accept the Book of Mormon scripture, it, you cannot, without engaging in loads of gymnastics and special plea and claim, it's purely historical fiction. Now, could there be some th- things where it's exaggerated, like ancient historians? Yeah, sure. But at the same time, there is a historical text, there was a historical Nephi, and of course, there was a historical Jesus who, in his resurrected state, appeared somewhere, probably Mesoamerica, in, in the New World. You know, you can't really get around that without, like, engaging special bleeding and stuff like that. It's so, um, which is one of the reasons why uh, I do appreciate you. Although we come from different traditions, we both believe you have yeah. to accept Book of Mormon historicity. That's a given. <laughs> yeah, and I, I think this work brings you to that conclusion. So at the end of this work, you finish my book. I think the next thing is now. Now wait a second. Okay, I have every reason to go to the next step of well. Where did some of these events take place? Let me read the story. Let me understand what's happening. I I think my book honestly is step one. I think first you have to acknowledge well how did it come and how did this book come into existence? Here's a book with millions of believers, believers in its history, believers in its coming forth, believers in this miracle. How, yeah. How it's did not, that take like place? Spam, it's not like spam email, which is like random. Yeah. It, it was it was a deliberate event over exactly. a number of years. It wasn't like say some sort of um, visionary experience, you know. And you just have like the the look uh, the what, what is basically section seventy six in your, uh, the LDS tradition, a vision and a text based on that revelation. Not that I'm trying to downplay it. It's like you have something much more tangible and being in a in the, in the plan, if you will, for several years, like the plates and the translation process and some complexities as well, like the loss of the book of Lehi, you know? Um, yeah. Well, and you can't do like one thing I know we keep circling around this. You can't do what Bowman does and write an entire book and not quote a single witness. Okay. Not quote a single witness on some of their additional, you know, materials. I, I it's just so flawed. You have about 300 to choose from. Okay, so here you have, when you talk about something tangible, my friend, I mean, I I say yay and amen, highlight, underscore from historical grounds, because you have these eyewitnesses, the three, right? Martin Harris, David Whitmer, you know, Oliver Cowdery. And you have the three of them in two with Joseph, once in a group of three, the other in a group of two, seeing the plates and the angel and hearing a voice saying the translation is correct. All right, so you have this incredible metaphysical you know visionary experience and then to you have to acknowledge the times multiple times that martin harris and others are saying do you do you see my hand do you see this hand just so sure as you see this hand i saw the golden plates here you have and you have account after account after account of this and then they're continuing this after they've gone through persecution and after they've been excommunicated from the place, the church that they helped found. All right, Martin Harris, shortly after he's excommunicated, he's with this small group left in Kirtland and they're trying to decide what to do. And they begin this this group of former leaders of the church that weren't in New York. They were converted in Kirtland and they, you know, and Parrish and others. And they're saying, well, the Book of Mormon, we we ought to just forget that and continue with this restoration push. Martin Harris stands up after, he, again, excommunicated. He has nothing. He's basically bankrupted by this whole enterprise, and he's lost his wife over it, okay, because she thought he was going down the wrong thing and wasting their money. So he, he's estranged from his wife. He goes through all this stuff, and there, and he can finally rid himself of this. Right. If he's part of some, cons- he can- this is the moment to say, you know what? You guys are right. Let's just start fresh. I believe in the core principles, but not the book. Let's go. He stands up. He says, "The I need to tell you guys something. The Book of Mormon's true. And he's going to use words here I wouldn't use. He says, and anybody that doesn't believe it will be damned because of it. That's pretty strong words from a witness. Yeah. Okay. At the height of his pain. 
at the height of his pain and rejection, he basically is saying, I know one thing's true. You guys can't let this go. Book of Mormon's the, the real deal. I saw what I saw. And you get this from all the eyewitnesses. You get Hiram Page getting beaten on the street. You get statements from Hiram Smith writing from Liberty Jail and writing about how the fact that he's in prison for the cause of Christ and in prison for the fact. And then he writes in this, he says, I, how can I deny the things that I saw with my eyes and my hands handled? So there's a testimony of one of the eight writing while imprisoned about I'm being imprisoned for something that I know is true. How can I deny what I've seen, what I've held? You talk about the tangible interactions, John Whitmer and his statements, uh, uh, talking about the tangible interactions he's had with the plates all throughout his life. So I, I think it's, it, it's just if you are doing history here you, and and you're writing this, you have to give a fair shake to the witnesses. If you want to bring out one or two statements that might be questionable there, you need to bring out 98 that are in favor because that's the ratio. And then you need to deal with the two and say, are they firsthand, secondhand, or thirdhand? And then how many decades after the event? When you have so many early sources from direct sources that are being multiply attested over time, then you, you know, then it should weigh in the scale of balance of probability in your mind as to whether or not these witnesses truly believed whether or not they had actually seen an artifact, handled an artifact. And I see way too a priori of a dismissal of the witnesses. And I obviously I'm on a I'm I'm fired up about this because this is easy. This is available. The, the works are available to read and to cite and to source for yourself. So if you treat the Book of Mormon and the Golden Plates and you dismiss hundreds of available sources from eyewitnesses and refuse to acknowledge what they went through, including something very different from the New Testament, they go through everything the apostles go through, okay? Even up to martyrdom, right? They go through financial destitution especially for Martin Harris. I mean, he, he ends up being a, like, he ends up being like the, the poor old guy given tours in Kirtland. I mean, you know, that's how it, the story finishes right before he goes out to Utah. Right. And yeah, but I, I mean, hanging on to these threads of a church, they're not longer even a part of David Whitmer living the longest out of all of them. And countless, countless retellings, so much so that when he dies, the Richmond Democrat, a newspaper, publishes the fact that in respect to David Whitmer, think about this, says nobody can listen. Nobody has listened to this man bear this testimony and at least not think that they've spoken to an honest man describing what he honestly believes to be true. <laughs> There's an independent source making a remarkable statement about David Whitmer there. And the same can be said, Oliver dies much younger, but his multiple statements that are available, multiple people remembering his preaching and missionary work efforts, you can compile where he's at as well, let alone his direct testimonies that he gives. So uh, the witnesses are powerful. They go through martyrdom, persecutions, beaten, tarred and feathered over this text and even excommunicated and having their lives threatened by church members when you get to the day-night manifesto. I mean, stuff that is embarrassing maybe to us, no matter what facet of the restoration you're from, okay, when you read that church members were threatening the lives of church members, and instead of bashing the book, they basically say, I know one thing's true. The Book of Mormon's true. Everything else might fail. But I know the Book of Mormon's true. What a remarkable thing. You have to weigh them. You have to weigh the witnesses if you're doing an honest investigation into the coming forth of the Book of Mormon. And anything else is just propaganda. It just is. No, um, thanks for that. Um, as with you, I think the uh, three and eight witnesses and the unofficial witnesses as well is like very strong, if not overwhelming confirmation that at the very minimum, if you will, there was a physical artifact, and some of them had a tangible but supernatural um, 
event happened to them, i.e. Moroni. It's like so much so, like, even the honesty of the witnesses is usually now conceded. Like, um, you have Dan Vogel in his essay on the witnesses in the book American Apocrypha from 2002, basically saying, yeah, the witnesses were uh, honest, but, like, they were, like, prone to visionary experiences, and then he kind of, um, got, uses, like, a lot of hearsay from decades later. It, the, the essay is atrociously bad, uh, but he basically concedes, yeah, they were honest. Um, and others have as well, including Bowman. Uh, he tries to dismiss them basically in like, well, they weren't experts in ancient metallurgy and linguistics, so they didn't really know what they were examining, but, you know, um, which is odd. But um, for those listening to this podcast, probably the best work on the witnesses, the tree and eight witnesses, but especially the tree eight witnesses, is that of Richard Lloyd Anderson, uh, his book investigating the witnesses, uh, the Book of Mormon Witnesses Amen. from 81. So good. He also has a very good essay where he interacts and critiques uh, Dan Vogel and Grant Palmer uh, that was published in the Journal Book of Mormon Studies back in 2003. So uh, if you were to Google that, you'll come across it. It's a very good um, supplement to investigating, investigating the Book of Mormon Witnesses. Um, and like uh, the, the documentations there going, um, on BYU, just some of the papers, mormonora.org has a bunch of them as well. So they're pretty accessible as well if you just want to read them. Um, first hand, second hand, and even uh, later accounts as well. But uh, before we kind of move on, um, you mentioned Whitmer. Uh, what's, I love discussing Whitmer. He's my favorite go-to of the witnesses. Okay. Because... As you know, he died in 1888, but he actually had his testimony engraved on his tombstone. And he had the rich, uh, that uh, newspaper, you know, on a number of occasions having interviews with him. And when he died, like, say, the guy was an honest guy. We don't really know what to make about him when it comes to this Book of Mormon team, but he was sincere and so forth. But also in 1887, he wrote, as you know, a book called An Address to All Believers in Christ. Yeah. Um, and basically, he... He did not like Brigham and he did not like Sidney Rigdon. So, like, there's some kind of ecumenical uh, relationship here between the two of us. But he basically said, like, Sidney ruined everything and then Brigham, you know, with polygamy and the changes in revelations. You know, it's, it's blistering. But in the very first yeah. couple of pages, it's basically, the Book of Mormon's true. I saw the plates. It's the, uh, the angel appeared to me and all that. You know, so even in this kind of a uh, very blistering attack where he's trying to prop up his claims to authority and he dumps on Sidney Rigdon and he dumps on Brigham Young and he discusses the high priest and the new covenant, you know, and um, these other inventions by Rigdon and also Brigham Young and uh, a host of other things. Basically, a couple of dozen pages. Oh, yeah, and the Book of Mormon's true. I saw the place and so <laughs> forth. So, I, and I kind of love that. It's like, um, you know. Yeah. Yeah. What an amazing thing to flesh out at the end of your life and basically say, I'm hanging on to one one piece of this. Yeah. You know, and, and I know this is this is factual. It's It's so true, you know, and and David, for example, you know, him being your favorite, let's pick one of the favorite moments of mine from him. All right. In Independence Square, ripped from his home uh, and, you know, lined up with a group of uh, believing men. Uh, guns are pointed at them. Bayonets are there. Guns are cocked and basically said, you can make a bunch of widows today or you can deny the Book of Mormon. And. David Whitmer begins to preach about the truth of what he saw and what he knew. You know, when you see something, you know it's true, right? It's 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 a step beyond faith. They're not the witnesses aren't dying for something that they believed. They're they're dying for knowledge. You're willing to die for knowledge. And David crosses that barrier. And they are actually uh he was willing to, to die that day. No, he didn't. Okay. They, it, the report is that everybody left, that they were, you know, he began to preach pro, you know, preach about the truth of the Book of Mormon, that the people left that day. They, they weren't willing to actually kill them. And, uh, you know, but there it is, willing to go to the utmost for what he knew to be true. Yeah, and um, when it comes to, say, the minimum facts for, like, say, the uh, New Testament and the resurrection and a host of other things, you know, usually, like, even Ludman and others will concede, uh, Paul was convinced he saw the resurrected Christ. No, they don't believe, they may claim it was only a visionary experience or the apostles yeah. had only a subjective experience, you know, out of uh, guilt or sorrow, but they were convinced they saw Christ resurrected and they were willing to die for that fact. You know, uh, applying the minimum facts theory for to David Whitmer at all, it's like, at the very least, you would have to conclude they were convinced, even after uh, falling out with Joseph, that they had this tangible experience of something supernatural, i.e. the angel, and something uh, 
and I'll qualify what I mean by this, something natural, i.e. the plates. Not that the plates were like, um, they were like naturally occurring yeah. uh, in, in the fact they were physical and so forth. Not like uh, there's no supernatural involved, of course, but you know what I mean. Yeah. But, but it's an artifact. It's yeah, an artifact. Yeah, so yeah. in that sense, uh, the physical yeah. or the natural. So, um, and that's why... And I, to I, thread it. Are, to... I mean, like, the, yeah, they were sincere. Just like, uh, they now have to engage, explain the data with the sincerity assumed. And to thread that together, just to your point, okay, uh, one thing I, I put in the book and I think is important to note here is if you had some of these things that we have for the eyewitnesses and some of the surrounding circumstances regarding the golden plates and the Book of Mormon coming forth, if you had that for the resurrection, which we don't, okay, we what my overall point is it's so much stronger of a case for the Book of Mormon, it's not even close. And I believe there's strong evidence for the resurrection. But if you had the first copy of the 12 apostles signing a manuscript that says, we all saw Jesus risen, we felt his hands and his feet, what would be the number one first thing in every book ever written about the historical resurrection of Jesus? It would be that document. Lacona would use it, Craig would use it, Habermas would use it. They would all say, look, here, we're, we're almost to the original signatures. We're, we're the first copy. And all the they're all independently testifying together that they saw the Lord. Look at this. We have that on the printer's manuscript of the Book of Mormon. We have the first copy of their original signatures. Now, the original manuscript, you know, we only have 28%. So those those signatures that would have been on that original are lost. But I, I haven't heard, I, 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 it's hard to take serious anybody that would just dismiss the fact that we have the first copy of that. Because if you would cross that over to the resurrection, and there's so many things of this that I think the book points out a little bit. If you had this for the other one, it would there would be multiple volumes written about it. All right, well, we have it in regards to the golden plates. And all too often, it's not weighed in this with the same historical lens and all i'm asking everybody to do is put the same historical lens on and evaluate the data with the same historical method and the take the same approach that you know if we had 70 interviews with the apostle peter do you think that would be discussed we have over 70 interviews with david whitmer <laughs> 70 70 interviews with an eyewitness. You want to know what he thought he saw? Read the interviews. But if we had if we had 70 times that not and mostly from and several of them non-believers, not all of them, but several of them from non-believers interviewing him. What wouldn't that be trumpeted across the apologetic world of of Christ, uh, which is also my world too, but wouldn't that be trumpeted in that environment? Oh, it, you bet if we had 70 interviews from Peter, we'd trumpet that. We have 70 interviews from one of the eyewitnesses for the Book of Mormon. Why don't we take a look at that in, in serious and weigh that appropriately? Weigh it appropriately. No, that's that's a good point. Uh, before we can move on, like, say, how um, there might be a double standard when it comes to, say, the application of this for, like, the resurrection, but not for Joseph Smith, and, like, maybe responding to um, Bowman's book, you know, with yeah. the notes you have. Um, I'm sure, like, some will counter, well, you know, some of the witnesses, like Harris, claim they only saw the plates with their uh, spiritual eyes, you know. And this, uh, I just think, in my, uh, just briefly to address this, uh, for them, spiritual eyes means, like, this kind of nubless, non-physical experience. But if you actually look at how spiritual eye or spiritual eyes is used in 19th century literature, and you can even look at this up on uh, Google Books, usually just like uh, that phrase in like 19th century. It's for like a physical event in space and time, but with a religious context. For instance, you'll have some uh, writers say how the Apostle uh, Thomas, you know, in John 20, saw the resurrected Christ with his spiritual eyes, or like how these historic, these tangible events um, were seen with spiritual eyes. It's not like, say, um, a mere vi a visionary experience in your mind or like not a real physical event or just like it's a physical s event in space and time but of religious importance or of a religious team that's how it's used in the 19th century because even in the whole uh, i saw the place with my spiritual eyes he also uh says like you know you see this uh, hand you know it's as tangible as that and like so uh palmer and others are kind of uh, proof texting uh 
the witnesses statement yeah. and not really doing the legwork as to well when we hear like in the modern context like spiritual eyes you think like uh only a event in your head or something like that but no that's not how it was used in the 19th century um so you know you have to look at how phrases and terms are used in the context of the speaker we did that for like say the new testament we do that for like other historical literature so again there's there is a double standard when it comes to say how we approach even language and phrases you know um you know so uh, and if like, you're oh. just gonna die on that vine so to speak if you're gonna take that all the way yeah you know, you have to be fair in what you're quoting and what you're so if, if you're just going to quote that 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 quote and ignore moments like this where Oliver Cowdery says, and I quote, I beheld with my eyes and handled with my hands the gold plates from which it is transcribed. Or or if you're going to, uh, you know, here's the here's a quote from Martin Harris. You, you have to. I guess you have to properly balance this and, and do exactly what you said. Put it in the context of the time period of which that was written and add the other sources and then draw conclusions around that. That would be fair, honest scholarship versus, you know, proof texting. Like you said, you have to include quotes from Martin Harris saying things like this. Do you see that sun shining through that window? Just so sure as that sun shines and gives us light by day and the moon and the stars give us light by night, just so sure I know that the Book of Mormon is true. For I saw the angel, I heard his voice, and I saw and handled the plates upon which the Book of Mormon was written. And you have to then, you can't dismiss the eight witnesses then, because they offer nothing along those, you know, uh, you have to address eight witnesses where, uh, you know, here's John Whitmer. Okay. Did you handle the plates with your hands? I did so. Then they were a material substance? Yes, as material as anything can be. Were they heavy to lift? Yes, and you know gold is a heavy metal. They were very heavy. How big were the leaves? And starts giving the descriptions. Okay, so... And these descriptions you know, are uniform amongst the, not just the singular witnesses, but the other witnesses. You know, there's a very yeah. general agreement as to like the size and composition. You know, personally, I think the plates were tembaga, but I don't think they would have had that vocab at the time. Agreed. But they were describing like, well, they looked gold and they were about between 40 to 60 pounds. You know, there is this kind of uniformity and you would not actually have that. This was like um, a con job. At the very least, again, minimum facts. They were physical plates. They had some etchings that looked like characters and... Uh, they had these dimensions and so on and so forth. So, again, this is why um, so many even naturalistic critics like Vogel really have to uh, abandon the, there were no plates, yeah. or it was all imagined. They have to come up with this really uh, nonsensical Joseph had 40 to 60 pounds of lead somehow, and no record of, like, who created them for him. Yeah, he, he would have been in a lot more debt than he already was if he had 40 to 60 pounds of lead. I love Martin Harris's quote where, I knew they were either gold or lead when he was before he was an eyewitness and he's holding the box and they're getting ready to put it in the barrel of beans and try and get out of Palmyra safely. And he says, well, I, I knew Joseph didn't have enough credit for so much lead. You can almost hear a little sense of humor from Martin in I that. Like yeah. he's teasing you, you know, he's teasing, he's razzing him a little bit. Like I knew how poor he was, you yeah. know, and uh, it's you know, so the descriptions, yeah. if somebody in the court of law, gives the exact same description of something verbatim, quoting it perfectly. Well, you know, then, then it's made up. Well, you can't do that for the eyewitnesses and the witnesses of the plates. When you add even the secondary accounts, when you compile them all, you get this nice 40 to 60 pound range for the plates. You get cold, having the appearance of gold, gold and copper. And you kind of put, okay, well, we know what kind of, the binding, you reverse D, this, that, you know, and two accounts giving the uh, the patina on the on the engraving. You know, so you it's actually the neat thing is it's it's the nuances of the differences in the description that can make a historian conclude that they're all describing the same artifact in their own words versus let's all get together and have the same story. And the very fact well, that's that not what's happening. And the very fact yeah. that these differences kind of show that this is like a new experience for them like uh, they never could yes have ancient plates so they might emphasize something like it looks gold and it's something well golden but there's this kind of a weird copper tin as well or you know they're yeah, yeah, yeah. so of course they don't have a there's a this copper. greenish hue which yeah. maybe what was it was that the sealed you know there's things which is, there which that is are... what you would expect even even like taking away like the supernatural and you came across plates and you were describing them and some others like in your circle described them 
uh, but you've never seen something like this before. This is this is what you would expect them to actually be described. Like some might be a bit more savvy, so they might pick up on say the katina or like the copper issue, you know. And, yep. You know, because they're hefting them physically, like, well, this kind of feels like a 50 pound bag I would usually carry, you know, for work, you know, in farm or something like that, 40 to 60. So there's this kind of, um, there's some differences, but like there are differences that you would expect to find. But when it comes to the convergences, you know, again, um, all these like little details and like little technical details that you would only expect if there were like physical plates and these people were describing what is now for them anyway, like a unique, sea generous event, you know, in their lives and the experiences of many other people in the modern early modern era um it, it does kind of show again um you can't really claim that there was no artifact at the very minimum yeah agreed and of course, like how did joseph actually kind of get this very complex artifact because if it was lead you would not actually have this kind of um a lot of the d hills or like the little nuances to this so um again like the fallen brody dan vogel approach might answer like say the 40 60 pounds but it doesn't really explain a lot of the other things as well yeah yeah, yeah. So. No, that's Agreed. good. Uh, yeah, no, that's good. Um, so, um, in preparation for this uh, interview, and maybe I should apologize, I did kind of recommend that you might read a book because it's cl it's the closest thing to like when an evangelical perspective that kind of acknowledges the minimum facts theory and outlines the first half of the book using that, like like uh, like Kona et al. for the resurrection, but claims using these uh, histor historical methodology when done fairly will show resurrection of Christ and. You should believe in this miraculous event but when it comes to say the uh certain aspects of the restoration and you know uh, there's so many problems you know it's basically joseph was making it up you know and so on and so forth and um that's a book by uh, robert m bowman who um doesn't like me <laughs> let's just be honest uh and i learned that after you recommended the book i learned i went in and saw some of the personal interactions and uh, responses he, he, that have happened yeah yes he, yeah. he, he, he once said uh Unprovoked, I hate all Protestants, uh, which almost got me in a lot of physical trouble up north. Um, thank you that for that, <laughs> Rob. Um, Jesus' resurrection yeah. and Joseph's... You're in the wrong country for that statement. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, he owes me an apology for that. Uh, Jesus' resurrection and Joseph's visions, examining the foundations of Christianity and Mormonism that was published back in 2020. Uh, he concedes the witnesses who are um, genuine, uh, but on pages 219 to 220, this is how he dismisses the eight witnesses. Uh, even assuming it referred to a literal inspection by human eyes and hands of the gold plates, it is of marginal significance. At most, it might be taught to establish that Joseph at the time had in his possession something that looked like a bound stack of gold-colored metal plates. None of the witnesses described the engravings on the plates beyond affirming the presence of such engravings. Although the testimony of the eight witnesses states that the plates had the appearance of ancient work, none of the witnesses could have had any uh, way to know or verify that the plates were uh, many hundreds of years old and none of the eight witnesses saw an angel when they allegedly saw the plates. So that kind of gives you an indication, like, say, the very biased. It's like, well, they probably did see, like, plates and they probably did see engravings, but, you know, they weren't experts in, like, say, ancient languages and, like, um, metallurgy, so... Meh. <laughs> yeah. which, uh, which he's like, the apostles weren't doctors. They weren't surgeons. They, you know, how could they have possibly recognized that, you know, okay, all right. So, but it yeah. kind of shows like the uh, naturalism, uh, whether or not he wants to admit it, that he reads into the uh, foundational events yeah. of Mormonism. So, um, what did you think of the book? And uh, do you want to share any thoughts, like uh, positives and also negatives and examples of double standards and maybe examples where, um, unknowingly at times he might actually um, support uh, restorationist claims uh, of the Book of Mormon and so forth. Oh, he does. Yeah, in a couple places he definitely does. So I will, um, by the way, I when I was writing my book, I came across this and I didn't buy it because I thought, well, it's this is a wrong premise. All right. And when I read the book, it kind of reinforced what I saw just from the title. But let me start this way and give... Uh, uh, Robert Bowman a little bit of credit on some things I agree with, okay? Um, <clears throat> page 19, I agree with something. He says, the sum of the matter is that if Jesus' resurrection really happened, then some form of Christian belief is true. But if it did not happen, then Christianity is certainly false. The death and resurrection of Jesus Christ are the foundational events of Christianity. If someone wishes to investigate the truth of Christianity, the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ should be the focus of that investigation. I, I agree with every word he just wrote there. Every word. And the reason why I want to do that is 
it's important to select the right miracle for this. The truth of Christianity does not hinge on Mary's miracle. It hinges on Christ's resurrection. You have to select the right miracle to test, to verify the truth claims of the religious movement. Now, his follow-up, and he does a lot of detail in this book, critiquing the first vision. And I would make the same argument about the first vision. It is untestable historically. Okay? When I saw he was comparing the resurrection of Christ to the first vision, I thought, my church is not, doesn't start or stop on the first vision. Now, do I think there's some historical validity and is there some belief I have in the first vision? Yes. But would that be the miracle I would select? As the, no, it functions to me like Mary and Joseph's experience functions for Christian, for, for me in Christianity. Okay. For the cause of Christ. It, it's a personal experience. Joseph has a personal experience that unfolds in layers over time. All right. And my church tends to stick to the, the earliest account, the 1832 account. I don't care. I'm not here for that debate. I, it doesn't matter. You know, it, What's interesting is he knows, I've listened to interviews from Bowman. He admits early in those interviews, yeah, you can't really test this, but, and then he goes on to well, critique the that, first that, vision. That's, that's the thing with Bowman, and I hate to say this, but like uh, he, he's the king of double standards. Um, uh, that you, is a double like standard. Him. I would agree. And I, I don't not like the guy. I haven't had the interactions you've had. But it's Count yourself in, lucky. Yeah, well, I, I'm, maybe I'm about to count myself unlucky here. I don't know. <laughs> but it, it is insincere, and that's the kindest way I can say it, to pick the wrong miracle to test intentionally. It, it's insincere. When you know, okay, I could tell you about a dream that I've had that I felt was from the Lord and it's personal, but that's not something you can test historically. You're either going to accept Josh Gailey's presentation of that experience or not accept Josh Gailey's presentation of that experience. Same would be true for Pharaoh's dream in Genesis. You're either accepting that Je that Pharaoh had that dream or you're not accepting that Pharaoh had that dream. There's no historical grounds to test that, okay? And there's no historical grounds to test Joseph's personal... There's no way to have multiple independent... Uh, witnesses there and so he makes these statements about well we don't have multiple independent attestation this isn't like paul's experience this isn't like this and i'm reading and going i agree so why are we testing this on historical grounds if we both agree that this is untestable okay you know a personal revelation a personal experience from god or from the lord is not something that is going to be verifiable on historical grounds and he builds a whole book to critique the first vision that way and i find that remarkable when there's a miracle he could actually test on historical grounds and then so i don't know if that makes sense but that's oh, that's does. my pitch uh, basically when it you know like trying to transpose things he's comparing apples with oranges um yeah a, a couple and things he, and he's he does knowingly doing this he, i would i would argue he couldn't write such a well-written book without knowing that that was what he was doing. But, you know, um, the other piece that I agree with is, look, here's a couple of my minimal facts that are, are found in page 303 of the book. So, you know, one way to test whether my whether minimal facts are acceptable as a minimal fact is if the critic would agree with them, right? And so... Uh, it is possible, speaking of the witnesses, that they sincerely believed they had seen the plates. Well, that, that's one of my minimal facts, is that the witnesses sincerely believed that they had seen. He's almost, I mean, I hadn't read the book ahead of time, but one of my, that's a minimal fact of mine. Uh, another minimal fact that's on page 303 into 304. It is possible that Joseph had something like metal plates. Well, that, that is one of my minimal facts, that Joseph indeed had an artifact of the purported size and shape as described by the eyewitnesses. My minimal fact is not concluding that those are golden plates. That's, that's my inference that then I make. 
but he's agreeing with my my premise there. So I would actually think that on historical grounds, if I presented to Bowman all four of my minimal facts, that he might agree with all four. He agrees with two incidentally, you know, uh, without in any intentionality to it. He agrees with two of my four. So he picks the wrong uh, miracle to to evaluate. There's no historical grounds to evaluate that one, which uh, because he's not going after the miracle that I question, then he doesn't have to quote the witnesses. He doesn't have to do the full board. But it's interesting, even though he's not doing all that, without reasons, that he doesn't give very many reasons. It's just there's one paragraph there with two of my minimal facts, and he doesn't give the reasons why they might be established. If he did, there would be an awful lot of quotes from eyewitnesses that would uh, probably, his reader would be like, whoa, well, there's there's something there that I hadn't heard that before. Um, so I just frankly think he picked the wrong, it would be like somebody writing a book about the Virgin Mary and trying to write about the historicity of that event and tearing it up and down on historical grounds. And a Christian might raise their hand and say, but that's a personal experience of Mary. That's not testable historically, you know, I mean, there's, there's ways I could dive in there that I'm not going to, but you know, are, are we going to question Mary's body on, on whether or not she was a virgin? I mean, there's no way to test that, right? Today, you can't test whether Mary was a virgin. We're accepting her testimony through a second or third hand source. That's what we're doing there. Doesn't mean it happened or it didn't happen. If you believe that event, we are just accepting a reported testimony of the event. That's all. Yeah, I'm sure like a counter will be, well, when it comes to the first vision, um, you know, there's certain claims made, uh, depending on which account, of course, I think they're erroneous, yeah. but um, like a revival and other things as well, and which can be tested, sure. But at the same time, like even if you read his material in the first vision, he ignores a lot of material, like uh, D. Michael Quinn, he's like 110 page essay on like going through and like uh, tearing Wal uh, Wesley Walters and the Tanners and Mark Croft and new one when it comes to say the religious revivals and stuff like that. So, um, but yeah, I would agree. Like, um, it's not if you're going to do like critique um, Joseph Smith and early uh, restorationist claims, that's not the miracle to go after. Um, yeah. At least if you're comparing, like, say, the resurrection with some miracle. Maybe if you were to compare, like, say, Paul's conversion experience on Damascus, you know, and the claims made and the uh, the, the date and stuff like that, and maybe compare that and contrast it with, say, the first vision, you'd be on uh, probably better grounds. How you could test that. He does that a little bit there. And I, you know, I, frankly, I, it's like, okay, but I, you know, but then Robert is let's say the first vision is stripped from the history books okay stripped from it to to his paragraph on page 19 about the resurrection if if you stripped mary's account from the gospels but still had the gospels if you stripped all the first vision accounts but still had the book of mormon would my church the church of jesus christ still exist would your church the church of jesus christ of latter-day saints still exist I would say yes that. yes would would the New Testament church still exist without Mary's account being in the Gospels? Without being in the Gospels, it would still exist. It would still exist. Yeah. So it's not the testable miracle. Yeah. He picked the wrong miracle to test. Yeah, All right. Yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah if you want to cross compare it with Paul, he does it a little bit. Sure. I'm not engaging that a lot. I mean, I, I could dive into it with you, but I, you know, it's like, okay, but this isn't the... This isn't the foundation. My church still exists with yeah. or without it. And also like the attitude towards like Joseph Smith, like he, um, and also the approach to the, what we call the first vision in the early years of the restoration. Joseph initially thought it was only a personal event and he's understanding its significance, at least in my view, grew. Because for the early Latter-day Saints, the first vision, if you will, was Moroni's visitation in 1823. That's why yeah, like, you have true. Like, William Smith later in life conflating to, because for him, the first vision initially was Moroni, but once Joseph understood, no, it wasn't only a personal event, it had like ecclesiastical and other significances and like the theological significance of it as well developed in his mind. Uh, that's why you have these kind of conflations at times amongst like um, people as well. But no, I would agree with you. Like, um, it, it's not the miracle. Um, now, 
can the first vision be tested? Sure, on historical grounds, but if you're comparing and contrasting the resurrection with something else, uh, that's not the miracle. So I'm sure like some will claim, yeah. well, uh, Josh and Robert, what is the miracle? <laughs> and does Bowman, how does Bowman at all actually do and fare? What is the miracle? Let's read about that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Let's do that. Let's shamelessly promote it and say, yeah, we got Amazon one to look link at. On the, uh, Amazon link on the uh, show notes, people. <laughs> but like, oh, it's any, a, it's a great comment? point. Yeah. Do you have any comments, other comments or other areas like um, of criticism or like um, that if I, I, ever does listen to this podcast and the, if he ever does a second edition, which will have to be thoroughly revised, uh, like some pinters or something like that for like a, um, or areas where you just kind of thought like the argumentation was just like a, uh, dreadful open invitation on either of our podcasts for a debate right open invitation you know we would we would well, welcome that Bowman right said he will never debate me so uh, okay well he's welcome on mine okay <laughs> you can be the moderator i'm sure that would go over well uh we all now, think the others are heretic. <laughs> <laughs> so i i would just say a couple of things i hit along the way where i thought okay he could have done a little bit more uh digging here he makes a, a broad brush comment about America being a land of, of religious freedom. And I, I think he, he assumes that and he quotes the Bill of Rights uh, from 1791. Okay, he quotes that. And, but I think he, he could do a little more digging there because that was a protection from federal persecution of religious freedoms. And there was actually two times the Supreme Court reinforced that the Bill of Rights there was not protecting against state persecution of religious freedoms. And also, the, then states then had to ratify their own version of religious freedom. You know, uh, there was one, I'm going to get these confused, Massachusetts and Connecticut. One didn't pass until 1813. The other didn't pass until 1833. Okay, so... I'm not saying that this isn't a country that had tremendous religious freedom. What I'm saying is when Governor Boggs ordered the excommunication of an entire uh, religious group, there was no federal protections against that, even in the Bill of Rights, because first that would probably inconvenience the politicians who were trying to win the vote of that state, but also the fact that the actual structure of it at that time was being interpreted by the Supreme Court as uh, not, per you know, Governor Boggs was perfectly within his legal right as a state body to be an executive who was uh, persecuting a, a religious minority in the in the territory. So, I, I think he could do a little bit more uh, research there. And I also think his numbers on Native American population demise was a little off. Um, maybe I'm a little outdated. My understanding was, you know, now this is debatable. Okay, you could probably cite a source here, but I didn't see him cite any sources on this. He he said something along the lines of populations went down to several hundred thousand of, of Native indigenous populations in all of North America. I think that is grossly, grossly low. Um, now, by the way, when I say this, man, do I understand the bottleneck that happened and the unbelievable persecution, uh, you know, the, the conquest that happened, the smallpox. I mean, don't get me wrong, but I, my sources say we're going from about 30 million, and that's somewhat debated among anthropologists, down to about 3 million, starting in from the late 1800s into the turn of the 20th century. He goes all the way down to a few hundred thousand for all of North America. Uh, that jumped at me in my eyes as just not being correct. I'm not sure where he got that source. So there's just a couple things there that I would I would critique and, and they aren't, now I say that those aren't primary things that are impacting the overall content of his arguments, but I, I just found a little bit lacking there and, and some citation work could be done to improve that, those two areas. As far, I, I honestly think the major critique of his selection of the miracles, my, I, I, would, I would hang my hat on that. Uh, as far as as far as the actual book content goes, so yeah, and as you note, like um, whether or not he will admit it, he does basically concede like, quite a bit, at least two of the minimum facts that you uh, bring yeah, up, you know, he does letters as well, um, and then doesn't engage. He doesn't engage why he's admitting those things, you know. So it's almost like he doesn't because he's not forced to 
directly address the golden plates because it's not the miracle he selected, he can conclude some things like he, he basically follows a Dan Vogel trail. I see him following Dan Vogel on the conclusions without addressing maybe even the arguments of Dan Vogel to bring out those to bear. So, yeah. Yeah. And it does make me like there, he's probably like a double standard going on because he would not probably like have this kind of um, explicit naturalism or allow for this explicit naturalism when it comes to say the resurrection or like say some issues because he does deal with like say how many angels were at the uh, grave of Christ and other things and the uh, sometimes like the reason he uh, uses for that and other issues he would never allow a Latter-day Saint to, to use when it comes to anything. Uh, that's that, that's at least my experience and the experience others have had with him. Um, but it's mm. not unique. Um, a lot of evangelical apologists uh, tend to do that. Like even like Hona, uh, he's no fan of Mormonism, but uh, what you have is very garbled if you read his uh, tract on the, uh, the church. Yeah, he attacked, like Hona attacked more the Book of Abraham than he did the Book of Mormon. And it was almost like, I, I see this kind of as the attack from Protestant. They they wouldn't engage the argument from my book. And, and my book's too new. They haven't yet. And, and I don't know if they will or not. I welcome that. I would I would happily send any of them a copy. But, you know, I I would just say that, you know, all too often when it comes to those, um, um, they they make statements and they they attack something that's not the miracle in question, and then throw choose to throw the baby out with the bathwater. Uh, so you know, Lacona in his article on his website, you know, he, he's attacking under the umbrella of what he calls Mormonism, he chooses to attack the book of Abraham primarily and then dismiss everything without engaging any of the arguments that I make for the minimal facts approach for the book of Mormon. So I coming from a non latter day saint perspective that stands out to me so fast and maybe it does for you equally, but like when, you know, I'm not, trying to debate this but my church does not uphold the book of abraham so making a book of abraham argument is like i'm like ah okay yeah and you know as someone who actually comes from a tradition that accepts book of Mormon, yeah uh, the book of yeah. abraham is like you're, you're picking a topic that is one of the more complex topics and usually the yes. criticisms are not that well tied out but because like you have egyptian and you have like all the uh, sensen and all these kind of um that jargon it kind of indicates okay well this is very complex and joseph must have made crap up and so the book of abraham's false um i really doubt like uh, like kona um if you're going to write an article on a topic it behooves you to actually be informed about the topic and when it comes to like kona, exactly it's, obviously it's not read like say the best the other side has to offer i really doubt he's read anything by carrie mill tyson or john gee or stephen smoot and by the way for those listening to this podcast i hope to be presenting on another podcast on the on the massacre of the book of abraham uh some of my research on that topic but uh be on the outlook for that i'll probably do it with stephen murphy from northern ireland but with that tangent um yeah it, yeah it, it, it does kind of seem like it, it does but if they want to go after it let that be their focus and go after it and then and you guys can enough, engage like, in that even debate if one could you prove, know like, yeah the book of abraham's 19th century super Africa, that would be a problem for us because we accept it as canonical and that would raise issues about say ecclesiology and things like that sure. for you and your group at least it's like Okay, it's interesting, but like um, we're over here, and you're targeting this other hill, you know, to use a war for analogy, you know. Um, yeah. So. Yep, it's so true. It's like they're, yeah, it's that's a perfect analogy, actually. But yeah, yeah. But we, we should definitely get you back on the podcast to discuss like your church's views on like doctrine and just uh, differences in practice and also scripture as well. Yeah. I think that would be really enlightening. Um, do you have any other comments from the Bowman book, or do you have any other comments uh, that you wish to share? No, I, anybody that's made it this far, I really I appreciate somebody that can uh, trudge through this. I think this is, if this wet somebody's appetite, I would just uh, say, you know, again, if somebody is critically wanting to look at the history of the Book of Mormon, I, I think that my book is worthy to engage in, in that way, even, and then respond to and address, you know. I welcome that. You know, I, I'll say you can give it a one star review, but I'd love it if you engage the content of the book to do so. You know, that's fine. I, you know, for somebody that's in in uh, the restoration movement, that uh, you know, I, I think they'll find this uh, very engaging. Um, this isn't a, a one church book, even though you know my church helped you know supported the the printing of it. You know that in that way, it's it, it's open for any restoration believer. And any Book of Mormon believer, it, it is it is certainly something that that 
could be read by a faithful Latter Day Saint and enjoyed. I think very much. So at least that would be my my well, it, it pitch. It was enjoyed, but it's by hopefully informed Latter Day Saint. So uh, yeah. there you go. <laughs> there uh, you go. So when it comes to say like say because we've kind of discussed like say the minimum facts theory for the resurrection of Christ, if you could recommend for like maybe someone for, from any tradition who might be interested, in, like say a good introductory book um, for those who might want to like. Um, wet your feet yeah. when it comes to say the, the historical case for the resurrection of christ um is there any because there's loads of hefty books like the right book you know and the lycona book. no no they're too thick yeah, yeah they're too a, thick yeah, yeah that's same. so is there any uh single book that you might recommend would be a good um entree if you will okay it's gonna be yes i do it's gonna be lacona's and habermas's book that they did together and i it might be it I'm sorry, I'm moving away from the mic. It should be on this shelf. It's not. It must It must be upstairs. But I'm pretty sure it's called... Let me make sure I say it right. Because it is worth... I, you know, for an introduction on the minimal facts approach. Uh, is it the case for the resurrection of Jesus? Yeah, that's what I thought it was too. And I, I didn't want to say it wrong. It is the case, the case for the resurrection of Jesus by Habermas and Lycona. Uh, it, it's a great intro. They they do the minimal facts approach. They walk you through step by step. They draw their conclusions, and you'll even see a little paragraph in there on the Book of Mormon, which uh, is again pretty similar to what we've described so far. Not actually addressing the uh, the content of my arguments, but yeah. it but it is is a great book, it's worth the read. Definitely. Definitely. And of course, like if someone wants to like graduate after reading that, uh, there's a number of books, including Lacona's Resurrection of Jesus. Uh, a new historiographical approach or rights book that deals with the historicity as well as the theology of the resurrection, uh, the resurrection of the Son of God. Um, so, but they're both yeah, hefty this, volumes. So. This is hefty, you know, but it, the resurrection of Jesus, new historiographical approach. If you want the graduate version of, of, of the first one, it's this. This is the landmark one that's probably, I would say it's the best, most detailed. He, breaks down the arguments he categorizes them like a good anthropologist or a good historian should you know and and does you know does something you know my book is much more along the lines of the first book we recommended it's really the wedding the appetite it's more for the for the plate of of everybody you know um it's not as as detailed as like lacona's work there so but you know at least uh it uh, one of the things I liked about the book is like how it was like a new, um, it added something new to the conversation about Book of Mormon historicity and someone who's huge into Christology and New Testament studies. Um, I did appreciate someone was using the minimum facts theory of Habermas at all in favor of the yeah. authenticity of the narrative of the coming forward of Book of Mormon. So that's always appreciated. Um, Thank you. Now, before we end, like uh, you also run a podcast on Book of Mormon historicity and historical issues, and I'll include a link on that uh, in the show notes. Um, you had one friend of mine, Neil Rapoli, discuss uh, his schol uh, scholarship on the Ishmael discovered of Nahum, um, which was a really fun podcast. So uh, before we end, like I might just like ask you this, like if I were to ask you, which I am, uh, maybe like. Uh, of course, like as with myself, you take the Book of Mormon seriously. You believe it's a historical document. And I do. I do. You, I'm guessing you think it took place somewhere in Mesoamerica. So, if I were to ask you, like maybe, like, what's your favorite, like maybe two of your three, two or three of your favorite uh, evidences for the authenticity of the Book of Mormon, uh, what would they be? Okay, um, my favorite argument for the authenticity of the book is in my first book. <laughs> okay, so sometime. yeah, uh, but. Uh, because to me, that's the first step, mm -hmm. okay, is looking at it's coming forth. Then the next step is the where and the background and the cultural context and putting on the hat of an anthropologist or an archaeologist. And I think number two then is to go where the Book of Mormon starts in the old world in First Nephi. And one thing that's remarkable is like biblical archaeology, there's no evidence whatsoever for 40 years in the wilderness of, you know, over a million people traveling through on foot you know i mean even the most maximal approach to the bible would really not find any evidence of those 40 years in the wilderness but here we have an eight-year journey from one family with a dating you know it's later okay it's more or it's more recent okay it's it's a but still i mean nephi and lehi travel 
from Jerusalem to a place that they name Bountiful over eight years. And it's just one family traveling through. And the remarkable, remarkable evidence that exists to support from an archaeological standpoint, multiple convergences that are happening. So if you take an approach like William uh, Deaver does for how he evaluates a biblical correspondence, and you apply that to the Book of Mormon, I accept Sorensen's approach to, to look at Deaver and cross compare that with the Book of Mormon. And if you do, the archaeological evidence for Nahum and then the, you know, and Ishmael's right at the top. And if you're looking at migration evidence, okay, well, you know, I, I think that there's, I, I would agree with the overall perspective that there's tremendous restrictions in doing a founder effect type principle with Nephi and Lehi and expecting to find that trace in Central America or in the Americas genetically. But if, if somebody's a critic and they're ignoring Brian Stubbs' work and the linguistic evidence and the fact that he is concluding now that about 40% of Uto Ashtaken comes from the Levant and he can date it based on some of the word choices of the cognates that he's doing, that he can date that pre-exilic for, for Lehi's migration. That That's astounding and is exactly something that we should expect where DNA might not be something we should expect based on bottlenecks we don't know the source population we don't have a random sample of the source population of jerusalem at 600 bc you know all those reasons we could do a whole podcast on this but you know brian stubbs work man i i just i feel like because it's complex and it takes 30 years of expertise to be able to produce it that it doesn't get the shake out of value that it deserves because it it just takes a phd in linguistics to really appreciate fully what he's doing there but to find 1,528 cognate correspondences that follow a multiple layers of pattern changes that test perfectly on the comparative method to show two migrations that match up and line up time-wise with what the Book of Mormon describes, I don't know what else we're looking for, but that's pretty good. <laughs> and I just feel like it's flown way under the radar. It's undervalued. Yeah, it's underappreciated. Uh, but um, there was a good article on the interpreter defending Stubbs' methodology uh, from a critic, yeah, from Robertson. Yeah, from the, yeah. Maxwell, yeah, from the uh, Maxwell Institute. Um, so who would imagine like 20 years ago that would be the case? But there you yeah. go. Yeah. But no, uh, yeah. no, I would agree. I think the Arabian Peninsula material is like amazing. Again, using De Dever, uh, William Deaver's um, idea of like convergences, you know, which also Brent Garner has used uh, for Book of Mormon events as well in the New World is like... Um, yeah, say what you will, at the very least, um, I agree with Jeff Lindsay. Um, there's no naturalistic explanation for at least first Nephi when it comes to say all these things, you know. And yeah. Neil's work, as tentative as it is at the moment, because it, how can we know it's Book of Mormon Ishmael? Again, you know. You can't. A, you can't. All right. You can't. Not archaeologically. But who knows? But, who knows, like, when it comes to say any future uh, discoveries there, like uh, Ishmael, and then, like, there might be an inscription from Jerusalem or something like that. So, uh, but bearing that, like, these are the yeah. conversions we would expect if it's a historical document and the translation of an ancient text, not like 19th century literature informed by, say, the King James or anti Masonry or whatever other naturalistic yeah. explanations you wish. So, yeah, I, I would agree with you. Also, like Stubbs's work. Um, I know Hebrew, I know biblical Hebrew, but I've never formerly Soviet user attacking, but it seems like yeah. he's, he's on the right path. But unfortunately, exactly. so few people know both those language families. That's uh, right. It, but at the same time, it, it is, uh, at least from my understanding, like linguistics and other things like that, it is pretty compelling. And it's not like, say, coincidental. Um, the conversions are at a higher percentage that it's uh, would be into uh, uh, that there was like some kind of Semitic uh, populace uh, coming into the new world in various areas and various times. Uh, so, yeah. Well, and I think, you know, one way to, I, I've heard people say, yeah, there's no, you know, and I guess my counter would be, well, look at the peer reviews of his first work when he doubled and look at it, go into the journals, look at the peer reviews from linguists of his first monumental work when he doubles the known cognates uh, within Yuto Ashtaken and he, and he builds that and how that was welcomed across the board. So, so to me, it's like, okay, this is, this is where, so how can I critique it? 
Well, my approach has been, I'll look at what others are saying of his first work, right? And it was applauded around the world by the linguistic community. Uh, and the very the second is this consistent methodology to that's right uh this kind of area it's like would indicate at the very least um he's not engaging in double standards he's not walking around the methodology he's not playing fast and loose um there is something going on here that should be taken uh into greater consideration than it has been um yeah 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 no i would agree with you i like, I like his work as well um so but no i just thought i uh, hit that out with you as i said like in the show notes i'll include the link to your book on amazon the Church of Jesus Thank Christ you. website. Thank you. And hopefully we can actually have you on in the near future to give an overview of the doctrine and history and scriptures and uh, some questions LDS like me might have. Um, sure. Um, hopefully in the near future. And uh, as well as the uh, link to your uh, podcast. So before we end, uh, do you have anything? Uh, are you working on any other projects or do you hope to write another book in the uh, future? I, I would like to to work on other projects and and write another book in the future. I, I'd like to pick up the podcast a little bit. So the podcast is called Book of Mormon History. It's available on all the platforms. You know, I I don't do as many there as I'd want. If you're looking for a weekly podcast, that's not what I do. You know, it's it's more like you know a couple times a year a podcast goes up and I'm interviewing an expert on topic X related to the Book of Mormon and its history or historicity. So. You know that that's where that is, and you know I I would love to do book two. I I have kind of some outlines. I I think there's been enough improvement in the old world and archaeology to do what I just did on historical grounds to do it on archaeological grounds. Use what archaeologists say about the Bible, get a broader discussion about that, and then cross compare the actual value of Nahum and. Ishmael w within that context. And I think we're at, and, and, you know, Neil's obviously doing what he's doing. So I, you know, maybe he gets it out there and it, he's already done that work, but I, I feel like there's more discussions there that need to happen where, you know, I took a historical model from a, you know, from a new Testament perspective and overlaid that with the book of Mormon. I think archeologically it's time to do the same thing with, you know, Book of more or uh, biblical archaeology, uh, understand and have a discussion about minimalist and maximalist and a fair plane, uh, and then overlay Book of Mormon on top and see well who would accept what if this was actually a Old Testament find. Yeah, you know. Yeah, when it comes to so, Nahum, um, I've often said and often believe like it's better a test than like other many biblical place names. You know where we don't have yeah. ancestor inscriptions and basically if the narrative in one Nephi with respect to say Nahum was in, in like say Obadiah or some other Old Testament book. Yeah. Uh, th this would be like say one of the greatest archaeological finds vindicating the authenticity of the Old Testament, you know. Um, They'd so, love it. Everybody would love it. Yeah. So like, yeah, yeah. So like uh, trying to- Everybody but Finkelstein would love it, right? Everybody but Israel Finkelstein. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, it, you know, it's, you got yeah, critics yeah. on all sides everywhere and, and that's, yeah. <laughs> So, but yeah, but no, it, that would be good, and hopefully, you do because, um, you know, you've done a good job like showing the minimum facts theory for the resurrection and how you can transpose that, be consistent, which is important, and then show there's exactly. minimum facts for like the historicity of these events when it comes to the restoration. I think that would be very good, you know, and um, I'm sure like Neil could team up with you because he's done a lot of work on the um inscriptions and stuff like that, but that would be a very interesting book as well. Um, so do keep us informed, and hopefully, um, maybe soon we can actually have you on the on the podcast. Uh, discussing that as well yeah so, awesome yeah. awesome and happy to talk about my church anytime we're a we're a simple church you know there's you know and, and actually kind of proud of that we're we're a small simple church and we we have great zeal for what's ahead but you know we're i would love to talk about my church and answer questions and do the best i can you know do the best shakeout i can so yeah um I'll, I'll hit you up when I'm back from London next week and hopefully we can yeah. arrange something. But uh, until then, uh, Josh, uh, thanks again uh, for coming on. It's been uh, good. And uh, of course, anyone listening should, if you're interested, definitely do get the book. It's available in paperback and herback on Amazon and other booksellers. Um, so Josh, again, thank you for coming on. I greatly appreciate it. Thank you.